God's faithfulness. When God has stated that He will do certain things, we can be sure that His words will come true, whether in judgment or in salvation. Here's Dr. Jean Getz to explain. To focus this principle, I'd like to read from some of the final words that God gave to Zephaniah. And they're powerful. Beginning in verse 17 of the last chapter, Yahweh, your God, is among you, a warrior who saves. Now listen to these words. He will rejoice over you with gladness. And here we have a series of He will, He will, He will. He will bring you quietness with His love. He will delight in you with shouts of joy. And then he begins to use the first person of God speaking, not just describing him in third person, that he will do certain things. Here's what God says, I will gather those who have been driven from the appointed festivals. They will be a tribute from you and a reproach on her. Yes, at that time, I will deal with all who afflict you. I will save the lame and gather the scattered. I will make those who were disgraced throughout the earth receive praise and fame. At that time, I will bring you back. Yes, at the time, I will gather you. I will give you fame and praise among all the peoples of the earth when I restored your fortunes before your eyes. And then notice the bottom line here. Yahweh has spoken. And the point I'm making is that when God says He will do something, He will do it. It's absolute. It's true. And that's what He's saying here. And that's why this principle, and let me just restate that principle. When God has stated that He will do certain things, we can be sure that His words will come true, whether in judgment or in salvation. It's interesting that in the short view, I believe that Zephaniah understands that God is going to bring these people back. He's going to restore them. The short view is that that happened. Because in Ezra chapter 1, verses 2 to 4, we read an edict from King Cyrus, who was over the Persian Empire. This is what King Cyrus of Persia says, The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth. The Persian Empire was huge. And the Persians took over after the Babylonians were conquered. And you remember that Daniel prophesied that this was going to happen with that huge statue. The gold head was Nebuchadnezzar in the Babylonian captivity. But then the chest the Medo-Persians. So that happened. And God is at work fulfilling His promises to the children of Israel. The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth and has appointed me to build Him a house at Jerusalem in Judah. This is a pagan king speaking. Whoever is among His people, may His God be with Him, and may He go to Jerusalem and Judah and build the house of the Lord, the God of Israel, the God who is in Jerusalem. This is a pagan king speaking because God is using him to fulfill his promises after the 70 years are over for the children of Israel to come back. And I believe Zephaniah understands that to a certain extent because Jeremiah prophesied that. He prophesied 70 years and he actually prophesied 100 years ahead of time before Cyrus was even born and named him. Named him. And so consequently, Zephaniah, I think, understands this. Let every survivor, King Cyrus says, wherever he lives, be assisted by the men of that region with silver, gold, goods, and livestock, along with a freewill offering for the house of God in Jerusalem. In other words, he's simply saying by edict, even those of you who live in the area of Jerusalem, you're to help these people uh, rebuild the city, rebuild the temple. As I said, I believe that Zephaniah understood that. But he didn't understand probably the long view, the far view. We can see that now, but this is even beyond us. Because listen 
to what God said through Zephaniah. At that time, I will bring you back. Yes, at the time, I will gather you. He brought them back to Jerusalem after the 70 years, but notice what else we read. I will give you fame and praise among all the peoples of the earth. That's never happened. But it will, because God says so. When I restore your fortunes before your eyes, Yahweh has spoken. Now, there are some who believe and they're strong Bible-believing Christians, and I respect them. But there are some Bible teachers who actually believe that, that this promise was fulfilled when they came back after 70 years. And that it is now being fulfilled in us, the church. Personally, as I look at the Scriptures, if I take the Scriptures literally at all, these promises to Israel, it doesn't fit that interpretation. What does fit is that someday God will fulfill His promise to Abraham. He will restore them and the other promises that He gave. And that will come, I believe, after the church age. Now, we live in the church age. And in Ephesians chapter 2, beautiful description of what happened when Jesus Christ came and He came to His own, His own people, but His own people didn't receive Him, we read. But all who did receive Him, that's us, to them He gave the power to become the sons of God, even to those who believe on His name. And when the Holy Spirit came on the day of Pentecost, thousands of Jews believed. The early church was all Jewish, basically. But then, as Gentiles, as the gospel came to us, we believed, particularly through the message of the apostles who carried that message to the ends then of the, of the known earth. And so Paul is writing from his perspective, and it's limited, obviously, and this is what he says about the church. For through Him, Christ, we both, and there he means Jew and Gentile, for through Him we both have access by one Spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer foreigners and strangers speaking to those of us who are Gentiles. We're not foreigners and strangers anymore to what God has revealed. But we're fellow citizens with the saints and members of God's household, both Jew and Gentile, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, the message that Peter and James and John and eventually particularly uh, the Apostle Paul became the great missionary to the Gentiles, bringing us this message. And the message is that Jesus Christ, Christ Jesus Himself, is the chief cornerstone. It actually reads, with Christ Jesus Himself as the cornerstone. He's using metaphors here, beautiful metaphors. And he says, the whole building, he's not talking about brick and mortar, being put together by Him grows into a holy sanctuary in the Lord. You also are being built together for God's dwelling in the Spirit. In other words, we're living in this wonderful time and have been for about 2,000 years. Eventually, I believe the church, as it's described here, will be removed from this earth. Then Jesus Christ will return. He will set up His kingdom on earth. He will rule and reign, I personally believe, literally, for a thousand years. And then at the end of that time will come judgment, the final judgment, and the final beautiful end of life on this earth as it exists and has existed for many, many years and centuries. And we read about it in the book of Revelation. It's called the New Jerusalem. And it's a beautiful passage of Scripture. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. Think about that. A new heaven and a new earth. And I think that includes the universe, which is mind-boggling. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea no longer existed. I also saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. 
Now, I believe during that thousand-year reign, great things will happen in Jerusalem as it exists even today in that very place on this earth, although there will be some reconfigurations of the earth, I believe. But this is beyond Jerusalem in the millennium. This is the new Jerusalem. And it's been prepared like a bride adorned for her husband. And of course, you know that Paul used the metaphor of the bride, or the bride of Christ, the church. And then I heard a loud voice from the throne, Look, God's dwelling is with humanity, and He will live with them. Think about that. God will live with us in the new Jerusalem. They will be His people, and God Himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death will no longer exist. Grief, crying, and pain will exist no longer because the previous things have passed away. That's eternity. Now, when you think about that and you think about application and uh, I simply raise this question. What are some of your favorite promises that God has given, and how has He demonstrated His faithfulness to you? We could have a wonderful discussion if we could open it up for discussion. But let me just share some of my favorite verses related to this concept that we're talking about, eternal life. When Paul wrote these words, For I am persuaded that not even death or life, angels or rulers, Things present are things to come. Hostile powers, height or depth or any other created thing will have the power to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Think about that promise. That if we're in Christ, nothing can separate us from Him. And I remember so clearly as a young Christian at Moody Bible Institute studying the book of Romans and it dawned on me for the first time that I really have eternal life. I really have eternal life, and nothing can separate me from God's love. Nothing can pluck me out of His hand. Those are the wonderful assurances that we have in Jesus Christ, both Jew and Gentile, and anyone who receives that wonderful gift of eternal life. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. So here's a wonderful principle, God's faithfulness. When God has stated that He will do certain things, we can be sure that His words will come true, whether in judgment or in salvation.